All right, perfect. We're at 6.40, we're on. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the new normal. It's hard to believe that the last ATC lecture was just seven weeks ago, and since then, the entire world has turned outside in. We are all COVIDians now. It's interesting because over the years of this lecture series, I remember talks by Hubert Dreyfus about the value of physical presence and philosophical discussions about the importance of human proximity and that it would never, that, that, the, that the experience of a live event being in, in contact in a classroom or in a, a lecture would, would never, the online experience could never match the, 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 the power of uh, the physical proximity. But what we never talked about, at least that I recall, was the idea that proximity could carry danger with it. So this is, this is completely a new reality and it changes the equations because we, we are really having to reevaluate the, what we value in terms of, of, of physical space and and how we cope and how we adapt. And what's been interesting for, I think for all of us is how things like this interface we're using right now, Zoom, has actually got some appeal, has, uh, has actually works to some degree. And we're gonna try it out again tonight with the 87 participants who are here and our speaker who is located in New Zealand and will, and it's, a, it's, an, experiment, it's an experiment. So. I'm excited about, about hearing what, what Tom is gonna to say. I wanna also mention that this is the, the last lecture in the series this year on robo-exoticism. It's been our theme for the whole 23rd season of the Art, Technology and Culture Colloquium. And we've had um, the, the, the speakers have been fantastic. We've looked at this issue about um, what Carl the, the idea of robots as something unusual and exotic and our both fear and fascination that comes with those. And we've used this term robo-exoticism to characterize it. What's, what's happened in the last seven weeks is that we've had a new way of thinking about robots, that they're suddenly being viewed more favorably than before by many people because they're safe. They're in some way offer a safe alternative and also can provide assistance for humans in new ways. But at the same time, this idea of uh, the, the xenophobia and the, the rhetoric that's been coming out about China flu around COVID-19 has uh, shown that this idea of exoticism, of, um, of, 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of Orientalism is still very much with us and is, is manifesting in new ways. So it's in this context that we, we, we conclude this series on robo-exoticism with Tom White's lecture tonight. And Tom is a, an artist and a, an, an engineer who's been working with artificial intelligence for over 25 years. He studied at MIT and uh, sorry, um, my family is playing some loud music in the background. We, uh, <laughs> we, um, uh, he studied at MIT in the aesthetics and computation group with John Maida and he has then done work on a number of uh, frameworks. He worked on processing, which was uh, as many of us used for, for computer graphics. And he worked in industry. He worked at, um, at Sony, Oblong and Factual. He's exhibited his work all over the world at many major venues. It's been, his, his, his art is now being widely collected, it is beautiful, very compelling work as we'll see tonight. And he is currently a, uh, a professor teaching computational design and artificial intelligence at the Victoria University of Wellington School of Design in New Zealand. So please join me in welcoming Tom White. Thanks, Ken, for that introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, be your concluding speaker, having followed your work and your lectures for many years. It's, it's an honor to join you uh, even under these unusual circumstances. Um, yes, so I'm joining you from Wellington, New Zealand. That's the virtual Wellington behind me. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about 
um, my work, uh, which I've titled Neural Abstractions. And uh, I'm going to, um, like Ken said, oops, sorry, like Ken said, I'm a, an artist and I've been working in this space for a long time. Uh, and I also uh, separately teach uh, at Victoria University School of Design, teaching uh, design uh, in the context of computation and artificial intelligence. So let's do a, an outline uh, of the whole talk and then we'll kind of dive into it. Um, so the, the first thing is I'm going to do is I'm going to do kind of a three minute version of the whole talk, kind of a, a TLDR version so you, we all understand what it is I'll be talking about. Uh, then I'll give a little bit of a history. Um, Ken referenced uh, some of my work at MIT and how I worked on a toolkit uh, that was kind of indirectly uh, influenced other toolkits like processing. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll take a, a, view, uh, a little detour there and talk about precedents in art that I think are relevant for the investigations that I'm doing. Um, and then I'll dive kind of headfirst into my own work so that my own work is, I've titled that AI representation and abstraction and that's the, the work I'm interested uh, in, in presenting. Um, then uh, after that, I'm going to contextualize that a little bit within the theme of robo exoticism, um, talking about my approach relative to other people's approaches. Uh, so I think that that will hopefully give some context, both of my work to other work that I've done and within, within the theme. And then I'm going to close out by showing uh, a little bit about um, how, the, how the artwork that I'm making manifests in the world, some of the sort of unintended consequences of creating these things. So let's get into the first part, kind of the what's the point uh, thing here. So here are the core ideas in my artwork. So the, my, my premise or my foundation in, in my work is that machines have their own way of seeing. So we're creating these computer vision systems, but they don't operate as we do. They operate a little bit differently. Um, and I'll get into what that means throughout the talk. Uh, so because they're different than us, we can create art for and by machines. So it's possible to create artworks using these machine vision and actually that can be understood by these uh, computer vision systems. And by doing this, by engaging in this process, we can ourselves appreciate the ways that machines perceive the world, how that might be similar or different to how we, uh, how we use our perception capabilities. Um, perhaps a more uh, down to earth version of what's the point is I'm just interested in how machines read images. So here's three artworks that I've done. These are all screen prints. On the left is an eye. Uh, and this is the, a computer version of what it thinks an eye looks like having studied eyes. Or on the right, this is a computer version of a face uh, made to look like a face that would be recognized by facial recognition systems. And then here in the center is a, is a print called Two Chickens, which is two instances of a chicken. And so I'm interested in what it, how it is that computers are able to recognize these images and how we can create art that they can recognize. Uh, and just to dive into this two chicken ones a little bit more, uh, one way that you can understand how the, uh, how the computer understands these is you can actually use computer vision tools or uh, uh, visualization tools. So when a computer vision system looks at this screen print, it doesn't see um, this as a flat image. You can go into its imagination. This is actually the the context that a neural network understands it. So backing up to the print again, this is the print as it exists. But if you show this print to a neural network and you um, use visualization tools, which I'll get to a little bit later in the talk, this is how it manifests. So this is kind of meant to be a teaser as how the systems, um, how my artwork is presented, but also how it's interpreted by computers. Okay, so with that as our, as our uh, you know, four minute, short version of the talk, we're going to go through a little more leisurely uh, through, through this. So I'm going to start off a little bit about myself. That's me working in my current art studio uh, doing some prints, but I'm going to go back uh, and kind of the deep history and so some of the um, some of the projects I did that are kind of foundational in this timeline that leads up to the present. And, and the first one of these is a project I did way back uh, 25 years ago uh, at SIGGRAPH and this was in this was exhibited there and it combined many of the themes that I was most interested in and many of them that follow me through today. 
So this was a, an exhibit, an interactive exhibit, um, where you would go and standing in front of a camera, you would see versions of yourself projected on a screen in front of you. And uh, the conceit was is that you could see yourself presented through the eyes of a virtual artist. And I was using um, ideas that I was kind of fascinated with this idea of meta art and agency and whether you could create a virtual artist that would look at the world and represent it in its, in its own ways. Um, I was using AI techniques of the time. So it used genetic programming, uh, which was a, a popular AI technique. But the, the idea here was to explore this idea of, um, of, of allowing someone to, to see, uh, to, to, to allow them so, to someone to make and to customize a routine that would present themselves in a new way. Um, an interesting footnote uh, on being at SIGGRAPH 95, if you went around the corner from my exhibit about uh, 50 feet, you would see this other uh, exhibit that was there. This is a uh, robot, this is Telegarden, and there's a young and dapper Ken uh, who I met at the time. So this, is, this was an interesting kind of tie-in. Uh, we were both there at that moment. Um, after that, I went into the MIT Media Lab. As we mentioned before, there's a younger version of myself. Uh, and I'm touching this weird pad thing here over on the left. And this is because my, my thesis, my master's thesis, uh, was focusing on uh, the, the potential multi-touch devices. So like I said, I was interested in human-computer interaction. I felt that the mouse and the keyboard was a really narrow channel for communication. Uh, and having studied video systems and video interaction, I was wondering if you could make one specific to the hand. So this pad system, these are all screenshots from my thesis. Uh, and you can see there's a handprint over on the right. This is actually the video information that's coming off the system. And I use that to create a series of applications. So there's a finger paint application, there's uh, different ways of pressing. And then there's this one in the center, which may look familiar to you. This is sort of suggesting uh, a sketch of how you might be able to slide things left and right using multiple fingers. Uh, in an interface. So kind of common, uh, common idioms today, but this was kind of wacky and nutty things to be re researching uh, 20 or so years ago. Um, these, these tools I was making, actually, I was still applying to my, to my artwork. So one artwork that I made while I was at the Media Lab uh, with David Small, we collaborated equally on this, was a project called Stream of Consciousness. And this combined um, my interface here, which you can see at the bottom, write my, my touchpad and it allowed you to reach in and grab these words that were flowing through a stream. It was called stream of consciousness. So we projected words down onto this flowing stream. And as you grabbed to trap these words, they would actually um, uh, sort of pop out and create related words. So you could change the content of the stream over time uh, by picking words out that you're familiar with. Um, the way that, that, it, that we incorporated the AI into that one is that it used a system called WordNet WordNet is an ontology of related words. Um, and so as you found a word, uh, it would show you related words in that ontology. And it, an interesting footnote on, on WordNet is that that's also the, um, uh, the framework that's used for ImageNet. So ImageNet is a, a, a contemporary tool in vision research for categorizing a data set using categories. And it uses WordNet as its sort of ontological base of categories, which is um, what this project also used. Um, and then one other thing I did at the, at the Media Lab, which uh, Ken referenced, was that, um, uh, and this was more of an infrastructure project. So I had my own research that I was doing in multi-touch, and later I was also investigating visual programming. But all of the students, uh, there was a small group of graduate students, about six of us, we all were using um, the same infrastructure. And I was one of the graduate students responsible for developing and maintaining the infrastructure. So this is what drawing routines we're using, what libraries we're using. And we came up with our own drawing library that we used internally called ACU. Uh, these are some screenshots of what uh, some of the sketches we did. So first of all, we thought of what we were doing is making these graphical sketches, these interactive sketches. Um, we actually have a live, had a live coding environment where you could code within this environment and you could open up multiple sketches simultaneously. Um, it was very high-end environment, re required very expensive uh, computer graphics hardware to run. But as Ken referenced on, um, some of the students in, in the group, uh, Ben Fry and Casey Rees, um, in a sense adapted this system and popularized it. Uh, so Ben was also one of the architects of ACU and 
uh, a few years after we developed ACU, they uh, separately came up with a system that was much more accessible and uh, teachable, uh, but it still had many of the same programming paradigms, uh, start and draw, um, just sort of basic programming API-wise. Um, and a separate student at the, at the Media Lab, uh, Golan Levin, also had a copy of this, which he shared to his students and through some mutation uh, ended up being the basis of Open Frameworks. So Open Frameworks, again, has some of the conventions and even some of the code that existed in this framework. Um, I, I highlight this because I think it was interesting that work we were doing as infrastructure at the time and how to best communicate and draw uh, on the computer ended up being an important legacy of that group. And I think it's a continuation of the work that I continue doing where I'm investigating drawing tools in a sense, but no, no longer drawing APIs or drawing tools for people, but drawing tools for, for uh, computers. Um, and I did many other things as Ken mentioned after that working in industry, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, we're just gonna assume that I then sort of hibernated through the AI winter uh, as, as uh, you know, I did some other projects and worked in industry, but it, it wasn't until kind of later that I picked this theme up and began working on it again. Um, so with that pause point, which I'll come back to in a bit, I'm gonna talk about precedence in art, which I think are interesting in the work that I'm doing now. So I'm gonna go all the way back to October 1927 and an artist that uh, I'm interested in and I think is a good reference point for my work, which is Stuart Davis. So Stuart Davis uh, in the fall of 1927 was looking to go in a different direction with his artwork. And, he, um, and so what he decided to do was he wanted to force himself to, to see familiar objects in a new way. And the way that he went about this is he took some common household objects, an electric fan, a rubber glove, an egg beater, and he took them to his studio and he nailed them to his, his desk so that they couldn't move. And he said, this is all I'm gonna paint for a year. And by doing this, he's just gonna, he forced himself to revisit these familiar objects until he could learn to see them in a new way, see and present them in a new way. Um, Here's one of the, the ones he did in 1928. And when asked about this later, he said his intent was to strip a subject down to the real physical source of its stimulus. And, um, and I think this, this goal of being able to look at the familiar, but see it in, a, uh, in an unfamiliar light, and then to sort of share that, that vision with someone else, is something that I share. So I'm gonna come back to this, but I think it's an interesting sort of touch point uh, uh, or interesting precedent and I think it's something that's not unique to Davis's work. I think that's a work uh, a, lot of, a lot of modern art springs from this, um, from this urge, but I think he embodies that very well. Uh, the same year that Egg Beater came out, uh, Harold Cohn was born, 1928. And he, is, he separately had a career first as a successful visual artist, and then a second, uh, second life in his career starting in the 70s, experimenting with generative drawing systems. Um, he was, he's known as the first AI artist when, and, you know, the definitions of AI change over time as, as we learn more about computing systems. He was looking at this in the 70s and 80s. Specifically, he's most well known for um, a, a system he made called Aaron. So Aaron was his attempt to um, formalize and embody his drawing um, his drawing routines and his drawing sensibilities into a program. And his goal was to make an artificial artist. He was very clear about that. Um, and so he, he made the system and uh, an interesting footnote is his system actually was very figurative. It was drawing people of plants where his most, most of his earlier work was very abstract, um, but it would draw endless varieties of these. So it'd draw different people, different plants, different compositions. Um, and, and, um, and this is the work he's most well known for, but actually, his ideas on AI art continue to evolve. And if you follow his, his themes past the 90s and into the 2000s, he was more interested in looking at Aaron not so much as, a, um, as, a, as an embodiment or with agency, but as a collaboration tool. And this is some of, a, I visited his studio here, I'm visiting him five or six years ago. And he was, he was talking to me about work that he was doing where he was going back and forth with the computer. So he would do a little bit and the computer would do a little bit. And the result of some of that sort of back and forth uh, is, is over here on the right. Um, I guess this is a theme we'll return to, which is sort of 
is, is are the systems we're making tools or collaborators? Or are they artists in their own right? And it's interesting that uh, Cohen himself sort of spans this uh, or changed his mind as he went along. But independent of his view on that, his, his core question in his research remained the same. And that was, what is the minimum condition under which a set of mark, marks can function as an image? Um, what he was interested in and what he means, what he means when he says what is an image is not like what technically makes an image, but what makes an image meaningful? What makes it uh, convey something to, to the reader? Um, a, a paraphrase of this might be looking at it from a representation and abstraction point of view is what is it that makes simplification work? How can a simple drawing be so evocative and seem to stand for something else? And this core exploration is, the, is um, what I think is, is an influence on me because I'm interested in some of these same issues. How, how is it that we can uh, embody a concept sort of and simplify it and it still carry meaning uh, in some simplified uh, pr presentation? And then one other um, art precedent that I want to talk about is screen printing. So this is more of a technical digression than um, than uh, than the others, though I do do sort of borrow the vocabulary and uh, some of the visual presentation styles of some of these pop artists from the 50s. Uh, the main thing I wanted to pick up in, in this talk was just kind of the uh, the history of screen printing and the process of screen printing as a means of generating artwork. So I was going to look at one of the uh, artworks I've done and then kind of walk you through how that gets made. So here's chicken. Uh, this is a, an image that on the right, the final chicken. This actually has to be planned out uh, and executed as two separate layers. So there's a brown layer and a black layer. Um, each of these layers has to be burned onto a screen or transferred onto a screen. This is essentially a fancy kind of stencil for you to press ink through. Uh, so the screen is then put onto a table. We put some ink on the screen and then we pull out a squeegee and smash the, the ink through. And um, this is me kind of doing that here in the studio or in my studio. Uh, this is a different uh, result. This is uh, an image of an eye, and this is going to walk through how that, how that gets processed. So you start off with the canvas, you take out one of the screens, you take out the ink, you spread the ink out on the screen, you squeegee it through, you get the first layer. The more colors you want, the more layers you have to use. So you, have to, you want a purple layer, you have to follow that up with a purple layer, uh, black layer, just line that up, press that through. Uh, and then the final layer on this one is a pink layer for like this, the eyelashes of the eye. Uh, and then that gets put on the screen, spread out, and again, smash through to get the final result. So that's just giving you a flavor of what the mechanical process is or the uh, production process is of, of, uh, of making these prints. And I should say, and, and this references, you know, as uh, Ken was kind of alluding to in the, in the introduction um, about physical presence. I'm, I'm interested in making physical work. So it's kind of, there's some irony in me having to present all this physical work to you remotely, but I think that, um, that that's what I'm interested in doing. And so I've adapted this very physical and traditional process of, of creating these artworks. Um, and here's kind of the result of this. So this is just showing one uh, way that this would be presented. So after making these prints, they're either made on canvas or on this case on paper. Uh, they're framed and put into a gallery. Uh, and this is kind of what an assortment of those looks like, uh, which is a perfect segue into our next section, which is the work that I'm making. So having gone through some of my influences and my, my process of making these things, what is it I'm trying to accomplish and what is it uh, that these shapes and these, this artwork represents? So we'll start off with some of these shapes over here on the left. Uh, and then we'll work our way to the separate series uh, on the right. So I'm going to jump back and remind us about uh, Stuart Davis first. So Stuart Davis spent a year, you know, trying to perceive and represent familiar objects in new ways. He forced himself to stare at, you know, an electric fan for a year until he could figure out a new way to, to present it. And this becomes kind of my starting point is, can we similarly use computer vision to introduce us to new ways of perceiving and representing familiar objects. Can we use the, these, these systems that we're making uh, to help us, can we leverage those in some ways to help us see the world in a new way and then, re and then present them? So what would that mean to use computer vision 
to understand an electric fan? Well, computer vision bottoms out in training sets. So the first thing we would do is we would look at an electric fan training set. So uh, training sets are, are collections of images, which are meant to be examples of the concept you're interested in. And modern computer vision systems use hundreds, or in this case, over a thousand individual images of an idea to, um, to embody that concept. This is a, a, a database called ImageNet, which I referenced earlier. And this is one of the main, it's, it's the standard um, uh, system used in, for, for benchmarking in computer vision systems. And this is their definition of a fan. Note that um, these vision systems never see a fan in action. They never see it rotating. They, uh, they have very limited knowledge of the world. All they know are these individual kind of snapshots of fans. So given this definition of a fan, I went about trying to, or given a computer vision system that can recognize fans, I went about inverting that and saying, well, if the, if the system can recognize a fan, can it create a fan? So to jump to the, the punchline here, I used, and this is an earlier version of the system, um, which wasn't using screen printing, but was using a, a related printing technique. So it's printed in layers again. Uh, and it came up with this print on the left, uh, which is a purple and black uh, ink layered ink version of an electric fan. And what the bar graphs are showing in the center is, is it's six different computer vision systems all trained on ImageNet. And it's asking it, well, when you look at this print, what is it that you see? And all of them unanimously and very strongly say what I unequivocally see is, is an electric fan. Um, and, and so this was kind of the starting point for my exploration is, is learning to how to create this. And, and the way that I did this, just to get a little bit under the hood on the drawing system itself, is um, as I tried to make a drawing system where the it could be evaluated at any point and then it could incrementally uh, adapt and move the lines around so as to optimize the response for a particular concept. Uh, and so this is kind of an inversion of how we usually think of using a computer. Usually the computer is seen as a tool as you know you have an idea for something you want to make, you sit down on a computer, you pull up Photoshop and then it's you expressing your idea through the bottleneck of Photoshop. What I did was I tried to invert that and said, okay, I'm gonna create a tool for the computer to draw with, and it's gonna to try to express what it thinks a fan looks like, and then in the end, I'm gonna to try to embody that in, in an ink print, which I'll represent back to make sure that it, that it registers correctly. So having finished the fan and uh, that series, I, I went into uh, a second series of works called Perception Engines, where I really tried to push on this idea of coming up with different embodiments of, uh, of different concepts, visual embodiments of concepts, all from the same draw, all in the same drawing style and with the same kind of parameters to see how many different results we could get uh, with the system. And I'm gonna walk through, this is kind of the core uh, that I'll walk through slowly to kind of explain how this works and explain some of the machine learning that's embodied in, in these uh, artworks. So the way that I'm presenting these is the artwork itself is on the is on the left and the training set is over here on the right. So you have a system that's trained on this training set of images, in, the, in this case it's binoculars. Um, and after looking at hundreds and over a thousand instances of binoculars, it draws this uh, version on the, the left which it recognizes. And so um, I, I don't have privileged information as to why it chose this, but I can kind of notice some things after the fact. So one thing that I noticed that's interesting about the drawing that it made is it put it in this sort of three quarter profile. So it's not, you're not looking at it head on. Uh, most of the binoculars seem to be more head on in the training set, but I arguably, you know, viewed at the slight angle, you can kind of see more of the features of the binoculars, which I, I think is interesting. Um, this is a second one, starfish. And again, it's good to remind ourselves that the, the system doesn't know what water is. It doesn't know what, any, it doesn't know, have any knowledge of the world other than these kind of context-free images of starfish. Um, and after studying these images of the starfish can produce this image on the left. And it's, it's notable, I didn't really highlight this, but the, the system is choosing not only the strokes and the line placement, but also the ink colors. So it chooses colors that it thinks uh, matches with the palette uh, of, the, of the training set. Uh, here's a third sort of underwater result. This is shark. Specifically, the ImageNet category is hammerhead shark. 
Uh, with this one, I tweaked the parameters a little bit in that I wanted to come up with a, a, um, a result that used fewer strokes. So let's actually look at the strokes here that it uses. It's going to sort of put these down one by one so we can see how many primitives are involved in making this. And it's only a handful, I think about 12 or 16 individual strokes uh, that are built up to make something that looks like a shark. This is a computer version that it renders it in ink. And then you see the results. One thing to note on the results is you can't fool all of the computer vision systems all of the time, but uh, you can fool many of them many, most of the time. Um, and I think this is something that we'll see over and over in my work. Um, having finished the shark, I did a second one on sort of that was with a, a, a fewer set of primitives on a low stroke count. This was iron. Um, again, kind of looking at how the composition is on this one. If this one is not viewed at three quarters, it's viewed as as a, um, at a right angle, which I think is kind of notable because you kind of seeing the iron in profile. But also the, the iron, because it uses the same number of strokes, you can play this fun game where you start off with the shark and just by moving the strokes around in software, you can morph it to result in an iron. Um, and each time you sort of land, you can ask the networks what it is they think they see and they will unanimously change their mind that they think they're looking at an iron and now they look, think they're looking at a shark. I made this as a demonstration actually to, to promote some machine learning concepts because it's interesting in machine learning, there's a lot of debate on how these systems work. And one of the uh, debate points is whether these machines even have global knowledge or whether they're using textures and other sort of local knowledge of, of an image. And the result here kind of uh, highlights the fact that they must have some global overall uh, knowledge or, or high level knowledge of, of composition because at a low level, these, these two uh, are very similar uh, in, in their density and their, and their textures. Okay, uh, a few more from the series, uh, and we'll dive a little bit more into the machine learning on these. So this is cello. Uh, note that when we say cello, that's not necessarily everything in the training set we have. In the training set, we might have more than one cello, or we might have things that aren't the cello in the scene. Uh, in this case, I think, uh, and this is, again, I don't have privileged information on what was drawn here, but I see this as kind of a cellist playing a cello. So I pulled out some of the, the, the data set that I think resembles the end result. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about ways that they're similar, but while I do, maybe you can, as a fun game, see if you can find one big thing that's different. And I'll give that reveal in about 60 seconds. Different from the training set that I'm showing and the, the one that got drawn. Uh, but to show some of the things that are similar, uh, I think in, in these sort of cellist behind a cello images, which are about 25% of the data set, um, you have two figures. You have kind of a dark figure in the foreground and a lighter figure in the background. Um, the figure in the foreground has some markings which are unique, some curved markings, something that looks like a, a fretboard or, you know, that look, has these kind of characteristic curves. Um, and then maybe my favorite detail on this one, and again, I think this is what it is, but I'm, I can't be certain, but there's there seems to be a hand curled around the fretboard at the top. This is, so in some of these images, you can actually see fingers and that seems to be coming through in the, in the drawing that the computer made. Now, one thing that's very different, I don't know how many people notice this, but the cellist that it decided to draw here is kind of improbably left-handed. So if you look closely at all the cellists in my training set and all the ones that I've been able to find, they're almost all right-handed, uh, meaning that if you look at which way, you know, which hand is on the fretboard, here, this one is holding the fretboard with the right hand and presumably stroking, uh, holding the bow with the, the left hand, um, which is the opposite. And this highlights one quirk in machine learning algorithms is the computer vision algorithms are blind to left-right symmetries. The way that we train them is with something called image augmentation where we intentionally make them blind to those differences. And so I think it's interesting to sort of see some of the differences in these systems bubbling through in, in the end result. Uh, here's a, another one where the end result is, is literally colored by the, uh, by the training set. So this is measuring cup. Uh, I, this, I have a measuring cup and it doesn't look anything like this. Like I said, the system chooses the colors and the line placement. Um, here the colors really surprised me that came up with this garish green version of a, a measuring cup. My measuring cups are always clear or maybe red. Uh, so I had to dive into the data set and see why it did. That, and I did find that there was a very small percentage, but five or so percent of the data set was this bright green measuring cup. And it ended up that these are something called depression glass. So that it, about 100 years ago, uh, companies were putting uranium into glass 
uh, and which would make it this bright green, green color. Now this, we've since learned that's a terrible idea, but people still collect these. And so as you can imagine, there's a, uh, people bragging about their collections online. There's people buying and selling these online. So if you go online to collect images of measuring cups, you'll uh, inadvertently collect a lot of these, these sort of radioactive measuring cups and they will pollute your data set. This is something in machine learning called sampling bias. And so again, uh, these machine learning issues uh, are kind of bubbling through it in the end result. And then one other one I'll show from the series uh, before I wrap here is, is tick, my least popular one, at least by sales. No one, turns out no one wants to buy a picture of a tick, uh, but I'm proud of it because uh, of the series, it actually has a very strong response. Uh, in fact, I, I tried to quantify that. And so to quantify it, I measured it against something called the validation set or the test set. So the, the gold standard when you train these systems is you have a training set which teaches the system what the concept is, and then you have a, a test set. And the test set tells you how good you do uh, in your training. And so I took all the, the tick images from the test set and I measured their responses, which is graphed here. But then I took my uh, image of a tick and actually measure stronger than anything else in the test set. So what this means in interpretation of this is that this is a more tick-like image than anything the network would be ever expected to encounter in the real world. Uh, it's amplified relative to all real world images of ticks, which is kind of a surprising uh, result, but not completely unprecedented, at least in visual arts. So if you, um, I think the best example of this is Scott McCloud calls this amplification through simplification. In his study of comics, he notes that uh, by including, it, by being very specific, you can reduce the universality of a cartoon image. In other words, sometimes it's best to leave some details out to make, uh, to make an image better match the concept that you're, that you're targeting. So if you wanna draw you know, a generic person of a man, maybe you don't wanna draw all the features of the eyebrows and the wrinkles and these things because then you're drawing a specific instance instead of a, a concept. So this idea of kind of optimizing around a concept uh, is, does have precedence in visual art. And in fact, is the basis of a lot of our symbolic uh, writing. So if you go back to uh, cuneiform writing thousands of years ago, it starts off being these stylized versions of, uh, of drawing. So if you wanna keep track of how many oxes your friend owes you, you put three little pictures of an ox in your cuneiform tablet. Um, and over time, these evolve into kind of being less recognizable. But an interesting, uh, an interesting result that it kind of, and an interesting hint that, I, that, that, that this is on the path of not only uh, representation, but also of abstraction. Uh, and so this is going back, this is the complete series. And, and I guess the way I would close this out is saying that one way to think about this is that each of these individual results had the same starting point. They were just targeted towards a different, uh, a different concept. So the thing that separates the cello from the tick is just you start the system off and you tell it to go in that direction. They have the same sort of parameters and the same drawing engine behind them. So having finished uh, the, the perceptions in, in series, I was interested in, in moving away from ImageNet. So it's, it was, uh, th this, this series is very much tied to the data set I used. And I was curious whether I could use these techniques to target online systems where I don't have access to the data set, where uh, these systems are making decisions uh, for us, but we don't exactly know why or what the basis of those decisions is. So my next series I did was called Synthetic Abstractions, and I decided to target online filtering systems like Google Safe Search. So I will preface this section by warning you that if you uh, are offended by uh, imagery which is not safe for work, you might want to turn away or pause the video and come back in five minutes or, you know, do what you need to do because I'm now going to do the reveal. These images, at least according to Google and Amazon, are not safe to be viewed in public. So now I've warned you and taken those away. Um, actually, for the, for, for the record, this actually does, in the eyes of the API, cover those parts up that seem to offend the system. I had to very carefully place them and got them in the wrong place initially. So this, these are ink prints very much like before. But the difference here is that I'm not targeting uh, specific concrete nouns like cello and tick. I'm actually just targeting this abstract concept like what is it that you're trying to protect me from? Can you show me instances of this thing? Can we draw this? 
So these are the, the first three in the series, uh, Horn, Horn's Dream, Lime Dream, and Army Dream were what I gave them. I came, gave them kind of abstract names. And, uh, but let's go through this in kind of in, in a little bit more detail. So here's the, another one that I did later. Uh, this is a large format print. This one was called Mustard Dream. Uh, this one uh, I enjoyed making because there, it was just layers of black and white ink on this mustard colored paper. Um, and after the print is done, I can take a picture of it. And if I, here I'm, I can uh, use the Safe Search API and the Google Safe Search will confirm that this is an adult and racy image with its highest levels of warning. So five bars is as high as you can get on the scale and it sort of scores at the extremes on both of those. Uh, Amazon considers this one explicit nudity and Yahoo considers this not safe for work. So it's, it's interesting to me both the results I get that they can generalize these APIs, but I'm also interested in, you know, we don't even have the same names for these things. Like the different APIs have different ways, different ontologies or different ways of sort of classifying how and in what way these are offensive. Um, after doing this one, I did, here, here it is kind of in context at an exhibition to give you an idea of what the scale of this is. So over my shoulder, there's the mustard dream, which I just showed and behind that is this work called Pitch Dream. Uh, very much the same results, uh, at least according to the algorithms, is that uh, completely different color composition, but still as offensive. And then my final one uh, was called Composition with Red, Blue, and Yellow. Uh, hopefully there are a few art nerds out there that are snickering maybe under your breath at my naming of this, because yes, it is the same uh, dimensions and the same color composition as this more well-known uh, work of 90 years ago with the same name. Uh, but in my, in, my, uh, in my case, this my particular composition of these three colors uh, trips the, the algorithms up. So if you take this print and show it to Google, Safe Search again, it says it's extremely adult and racy. And uh, if you show it to Amazon, and, and these ontologies change over time, but I tested this one just last night and it used to call it explicit nudity and the, the latest version of the API also adds sexual activity to that. I'm not sure what that means and maybe I'm glad I don't know. So the, the point here is that um, I kind of, in this exploration, um, I, I broadened my, my work to include, include the decisions of online systems, but also to kind of uh, target systems that were making decisions on our behalf. And that's a theme that I, I continued forward with. So after finishing this series, uh, this past year, I went back to doing more concrete nouns, more objects, but in this, in, but now I'm making sure that they, they're not specific to any particular training set. I'm making sure that any result I get generalizes to most other uh, AI vi computer vision systems. So look, I'm gonna go through and look at some of the, the more recent work there. So this is presented slightly differently than before. Uh, I am again showing the training set on the left side. And then in the center, I'm showing the, com the completed print. This time it's on Canvas. Uh, and then on the right, I'm showing what happens when I show that print to the Google Vision API. So you can ask Google Vision, uh, here's a, uh, an artwork. Can you please tell me what it contains? And it will give you these helpful labels. So I, in this case, I have a data set trained on killer wells. Uh, and then I have my print. And then when I show the print to the computer, the, the Google's API, it says, well, some of the things I think this is in this image is a killer whale or a marine mammal or a whale or a dolphin. So you see, or tail. So you see many of the, the components or the bits of the orca are kind of uh, encapsulated in this print. Uh, a few more of these. This is a, another one in the same vein, penguin. Um, this is a very simple print. So this is just a one layer black print on blue but it, it captures many of the sort of visual qualities and you can see that the online API comes back with uh, penguin. Amusingly, it has other, uh, two other categories, flightless bird and bird, and then specific types of penguins like emperor penguin or parts of the penguin like the beak that are triggered in this API response. I, I also do um, uh, collaborations and commissions and work for hire, it's kind of traditional illustration work. And this was work I did with, uh, it was with a band called Yacht last year. They were interested in making work to go with an album they were releasing and they wanted some artwork, uh, some computer generated artwork of an eye. So we collected a data set of eyeballs. This was a custom data set. We taught the computer what, how to draw these eyes. Uh, and then in the end, we made the print in the center, which ended up being uh, part of their album artwork. 
And then you can see also uh, when you show this artwork to the computer vision systems at Google and you get responses like face, facial expression, eyebrow, eyelash, uh, things like that. So it does seem to be evocative still of uh, sort of the eye part of the face. And then I think there's one last one here, uh, rabbit. Uh, I include this one not only because rabbits are cute and not only because I enjoy printing white ink because it's a sort of a unique effect I can get away with, uh, but, but also because um, uh, the ontology of this one I thought that came back from Google was really amusing. So for whatever reason, it has separate categories for hair, rabbit, rabbit and hairs, and domestic rabbit, which seems to trigger all of them. Um, and also because I think this one, like I, I, this, I, I have trouble interpreting this rabbit. Sometimes I think it's a rabbit hopping away from me, and sometimes I think it's more facing me. Nevertheless, it seems to kind of uh, abstractly capture some, some rabbit qualities to it. Um, so having finished the, this sort of series of individual canvases, going into this year, what I've been doing is I've been collecting these and presenting them in groups. I found that uh, presenting uh, not one, so this is one particular version of a rabbit, uh, but you know, this is, there's many possible endpoints for trying to draw a rabbit from the computer's point of view. And sometimes it's more interesting to see these multiple endpoints simultaneously than to see any one of them. So this is uh, an exhibition uh, work in an exhibition in New York at Sabar Gallery that was exhibited earlier this year. And on the left side, we have six uh, individual canvases of chickens. And then on the right side, we have six individual canvases of eyes. So here you can see um, different results from the same parameters, from the same palette, trying to express the same concept. So for example, one thing you'll notice about the chicken, and I come back to this as one of the decisions, one of the many decisions the system is making is all these chickens are viewed in profile, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right. Um, but very rarely, you know, in this sense, it's, it's hard to recognize a chicken maybe from head on. Um, you also have a lot of other sort of uh, other details that, that kind of make this to the computer a chicken. Um, but the, the point here is that uh, in my more recent work, I'm collecting these, uh, making collections uh, of images and presenting these together, which I think better uh, communicates the sort of constraints and the visual, uh, the visual uh, um, cliches that are being incorporated into these works. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. So I've gotten you all the way caught up to, to what my current artwork is, but I, I'm gonna step back now and I'm gonna contextualize that a little bit within the, um, within the theme of to uh, the theme of, of this lecture series and also kind of with what other artists are doing in, in my field. So there's other approaches to AI art, but, um, and, and for a while when I came out of what I called my hibernation around five years ago, I was very much into this different technique uh, called generative networks. So there's things called generative adversarial networks or variational autoencoders, usually called GANs or VAEs. Uh, and these are systems that can generate kind of convincing imagery uh, from sample images. So on the left, here's an example of a face grid I made uh, four years ago, and this was use, using uh, these techniques. But what I want to emphasize is that even though I was using a very different technique, I think that my narrative is kind of similar as long in the same vein. Um, and you can also use the same technique and have a very different narrative. And I'm going to sort of tie this into this theme of robo-exoticism and how uh, and how really the narrative might be more important than, than the technique used. So what is this neural face grid? So this is, what I was interested in is, is in how uh, the computer represent, can represent faces uh, and what the possibilities of faces. So one of the works I did later in the year um, was called Portrait Manifold. I did a series of these. And the idea here was that you could see the possibility space of faces. So in other words, I was still interested in how the computer organizes its thoughts how it, uh, what makes one face like another face. So if I zoom in to this top left corner, this sort of darker area, you can kind of see the individual faces and how the faces are kind of grouped to be similar. Similar faces are near each other, um, but then you can kind of back up and you kind of get this overwhelming uh, space of possible faces. And, and, and so uh, I guess the point of this is that uh, I, I was following some of the same themes, which is, um, how computers see the world, how computers organize their thoughts. Uh, but I was presenting it through this, this medium of, of a network that can generate imagery directly. And this was meant to be kind of, and it was exhibited printed on the wall so you could walk up to it and, 
can move around it. Um, implicit in, in my presentation of this is the idea that I'm using computer vision algorithms or machine learning algorithms as tools. And there's other ways artists use these same tools. So I'm, I'm just gonna step through a few of these um, in no particular order. So Helena Saren uh, has a technique where she uses these same techniques, but she um, very carefully curates small data sets and gets very unique results by limiting the things that the, the, the training set has exposure to. So if you're interested in that work, um, there's a reference to it there. But for the purpose of this talk, the, the, the point is, is that it's a very different type of investigation with a very different goal. Uh, similarly, uh, Mario Klingemann has a, set, a process using these same generative adversarial networks, also on phases, but he's not as much interested in, um, in presenting them in multiples like I did, but he's interested in actually damaging them in some way. So he has a series called Neural Glitch, where he kind of inflicts brain damage on the network after training to see how it visually manifests in the image. Again, a very interesting line of work, uh, but very different than, than how I was using the same tools, okay? And let's contrast that with two other artists which are using the same tools, very similar code bases, but they're coming at it with very different narratives. So on the left, I've, I've highlighted uh, Robbie Barrett's work in Art DC GAN. Specifically, he made a, a one called Portrait GAN where he did a study of portrait, portrait, uh, portraits and whether you could generate sort of families of portraits. So similar to my investigation where you could generate this large body of portraits and it's interesting the space of possible portraits that come out. And on the right, you have Obvious, who uh, quite famously made one of these and sold it at Sotheby's a couple of years ago, but they had a very different narrative around there. So I wanna sort of highlight the differences here. So their work was to take one of these particular, and they had a separate way of using these tools, but they, they took the sort of same um, technical stack, the same technology, but they pulled one result out and they said, here's a, uh, a portrait generated by the computer the computer has agency in this. We're gonna print it out. We're gonna sign it with a formula to signify that the, the computer is the author of this work and put it in a gilded frame. And this is a work comp completed by an artificial intelligence, okay? So here, I, I, I guess what I'm highlighting is that um, this is a very different narrative. And um, this is one that resonates with people. This, like, there's a reason that, that this uh, gets so much exposure is because I think that this type of approach really does play into the fears and fantasies and stereotypes of automation. So we're scared of machines and what they can do. And so this idea that you can have a machine being an artist, I think is a very, um, you know, it's a powerful, it's a powerful concept. Some in the AI art community take this even further. And one way that you can really take this further is with robotics. So um, here, you know, this is, I, I've, I've prefaced this as saying that I, I see the differences between these works is basically an argument between tool and autonomy. If you want to take the autonomy to a limit, then it helps to embody your agent in a physical form. So I think one extreme of the spectrum is ADA, which is uh, generated by a group called Engineered Arts. That's the company that made this. And they made something which they proclaim as, a, as an AI robot artist. But here they're not only satisfied, they weren't satisfied just giving it sort of the machinery of a robot that actually has a face and hair and a woman's appearance. And it kind of takes this to an extreme. Um, and, and this is, like I said, this is great storytelling and it's very compelling. Uh, and it's been around for a long time. So these drawing automata have a rich history. I'm just gonna briefly show one from 200 years ago uh, that's, uh, that this was an Edo period Japan that was a calligraphy automaton. So when clockwork and machinery made it to Japan, it got incorporated into uh, sort of these fascinating drawing machines and they could draw just by moving gears around these complicated shapes. And if you pull the, the curtain on these, you'll see underneath it's just a series of gears. Um, I'm not saying that's how the systems work now. I guess I'm saying that the, the, we've always been fascinated by things that move and act like us. And I think that uh, that's a form of exoticism is this sort of performative aspect of art making. Um, for myself, uh, I'm not as interested in that. In fact, I'm a little bit worried about it as far as what I'm trying to do. So I think that what, I, what I've tried to say in this short section is that there's different ways of sort of framing what you're trying to do. 
One is you can say that the, the process has agency itself and that it's creating the artwork and there's different ways of highlighting that. Or you can say that it's you creating the artwork but you are using the software as a tool or maybe if you're being generous as a collaborator. Uh, and we talked about that with Harold Cohen going on a journey from one to another. And I'm very much in the camp of, of, a, uh, of using the software as a tool. But I, I don't disparage anyone that takes the agency approach. I think the agency uh, plays into, like Ken was saying, these, the fears and the fantasies that people currently have about automation, and it's a way of expressing those. Um, for me, I see, um, I do think of these systems of being exotic, and I think of them as being very different than, than us, and it's kind of a guilt-free exoticism. So we're creating these, these are artificial systems we're creating in our image, but then they end up not working as we expect them and not doing things the way we do things. And I think that's fascinating. And diving into that is what I, my work is about. Um, and I'm satisfied. I mean, uh, I, I stay, and one of the reasons I chose screen printing, I should say, is to try to stay away from the slippery slope of, uh, of the process itself being interesting. Screen printing is a very mechanical kind of mundane process, uh, which really leaves me to highlight the work uh, or highlight the my work is is hopefully embodied in the end result and not so much in the, in the way that it's made um, so for example but but I think that the 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 um, uh, the concepts are what are interesting and and I think you the the computer's idea of what these concepts are are uncanny and unfamiliar in funny ways so this print over here on the left is a print I did last year of a Dalmatian dog um, I think it's kind of cute and frightening at the same time it looks like no dog you've ever seen, but it kind of reminds us that these systems know visually what makes a Dalmatian, but has no idea what a dog is in real life. They don't have the common sense of knowing how these parts assemble into a whole. And I think for me, uh, exploring sort of the uncanny world of the concepts is uh, more rewarding than exploring the sort of performative aspects of how, how these, uh, it's exploring the internal world of, of these systems is more rewarding than exploring how they, they manifest or how the, how the actual um, work gets executed. Okay, so I'll step off my soapbox there um, and I'll close off showing uh, kind of some of the, how I interpret my work and how my work gets interpreted for me. So the last section of my talk is called Eyes of a Machine. So here, um, how, how do we understand, having created these things, how do we understand them? So uh, we can ask the computer what it sees, which is kind of what I've been showing you, but there's a lot of unintended consequences, which are also interesting to explore. And then I'll close out by showing how we can intentionally try to visualize uh, the imagination of these networks to understand what it is they're seeing when they look at these artworks. And as I go through these, one thing I wanna highlight uh, here is that riffing back to Magritte's uh, uh, treachery of images, when he said, this is not a pipe, if you show that image to a computer vision system, it absolutely tells you it is a pipe. And so one of the things to keep in mind is these vision systems don't have the idea of that they're not looking at the real thing, that they're looking at an abstraction of a thing. So I'm gonna come back to this and I think it's one of the things that makes the work uh, interesting. So what, how can we understand this? So as I said, we can just ask the system what it sees. So here's a picture of me. Uh, with a, a canvas work I did called Six Chickens, and I can upload this to an API and ask it to classify it for me. And what comes back is, it says, well, I see a person, and I see a chicken, and a chicken, and a bird, and a chicken, and a chicken, and a chicken. Uh, so that's its characterization of what it sees, uh, which is really useful, and it's the bread and butter of how I evaluate these systems. Um, and it's useful to go, going back to the previous slide, to keep in mind that it doesn't say it sees a picture of a chicken, it actually thinks it sees a chicken, right? To be more specific, there's no distinction in the, the systems between a chicken and an abstraction of a chicken. Um, so this would be, for all it knows, I'm standing in a chicken coop, for example. This is me, a person with chickens. Um, so how does this actually, how, do, how does this manifest in the world? Or what, you know, these systems are, create, are connected to decision-making systems and how can that affect uh, things? So I'm going to go back to an exhibition, the exhibition I did of my uh, not safe for work prints. And uh, this is me smugly standing in front of that exhibition after it was completed. And after uh, that was done, I went around and tried to take some pictures of the works that were hanging there. 
the lighting was terrible. As you can see on the left, there's a lot of glare coming off of that print. But I thought, well, I, I, let me just post that to my Tumblr blog. And lo and behold, when I posted it, it got rejected. And it says, well, uh, this photo cannot be posted to your blog because it contains adult content and violates our community guidelines. So uh, this was one example of how, uh, you know, because these systems think that this is some sort of explicit imagery or not safe for imagery, they can refuse or filter it from platforms where I'm trying to post it. And this, uh, I mean, I have to say I was tickled with this result and I was kind of trying this out, but it, so this was a, an example of how this, this can, uh, can manifest itself in a decision system. Uh, in a separate instance of this, and the, uh, a few months later, um, Architectural Digest got in touch with me because they wanted to do an article on AI art and wanted to know if I had any uh, images that they could provide. And I went back and forth with them a little bit about what might be appropriate, but they really just wanted something colorful. And so they ended up do, putting one of my most colorful works in there, which was Lime Dream. Um, unfortunately, Lime Dream, as I told you, is kind of not safe for work, uh, but it got printed anyway. Uh, I got a copy of the Glossy magazine in the mail. And even when I take this kind of not so well framed photo of it and upload it to the system, it comes back and registers it as explicit nudity. Uh, so I don't know what the punchline here is. I don't think I broke the law. I'm not sure. In any case, maybe this was the first instance of a cybernetic centerfold in Architectural Digest of all places. It's just a weird way that these images kind of get out into the world and can, can go uh, and be measured against real systems. Uh, and then two more, uh, and, then, and then we'll go to the vision example. So this is a, a canvas print I did last year called Eye and Face. As I mentioned earlier, the face on the right was meant to trigger vision uh, detection systems. So it meant it's supposed to trigger facial recognition systems. Um, I took this to NeurIPS, the conference last year, um, and I hung it up. Uh, before I hung it up, I actually had to put it together in my hotel room the night before. So I got the canvas out and the bars out and had to restretch it. I was very proud of myself and hung it up on the wall of the hotel room where it didn't fit in at all, but I thought it was really funny. And I took my camera out to take a picture of it. And this is a screenshot from my, my iPhone. And I was, uh, I had not seen this before and I was very happy. I don't know if you see that little yellow rectangle in the middle, I'll zoom in on it. And what happened was is that uh, this, this painting uh, this, that I had made uh, triggered the vision system in the iPhone itself. And so it said, oh, I see there's a person in the scene. Let me try to focus on that for you. Uh, and so this is kind of a, uh, an unintended consequence again of how these systems are bubbling through decision processes. And then my final one of these unintended consequences is just getting ready for this talk. As you can imagine, I was getting images together, going through, digging up old imagery. I'm pulling up my phone. Hopefully it organizes things by people and places and categories. The categories in particular I noticed were kind of weird. Uh, it had cars and animals and food, but as you can imagine, when I'm working, I take a lot of pictures of work in progress, and it's tend to seem like it was categorizing those for me using vision techniques. So I decided to probe into that a little bit. Uh, that's a picture of the banana. So sure enough, when I search for banana in the search bar, I get lots of images of the print of the banana in different colors. Uh, same thing with the scorpion, a different print I did. Thinks all of my different versions of the scorpion uh, look like scorpions electric fans. Sombrero was really funny because, you know, sombrero is kind of a niche uh, category. Uh, also, I have a picture of a friend in a straw hat, which triggered it. Um, and this goes back to the, what I'm saying before, like the, the, to the computer vision system, there's no difference between me having these images, these artworks on my, on my photo library and having the real thing. So uh, an, an amusing instance of this is a syringe. I don't know why I took a photo of a real syringe years ago. This is an actual needle that's going to get plunged into my arm. When, when they asked Magritte, like, why isn't, why isn't this a pipe? He said, well, you know, you can't smoke it. You can't get any satisfaction from it. Uh, in the same way, you know, this representation of a syringe is very different uh, than the actual syringe. Yet at the ontology of the computer vision systems, it gets folded down into the same thing. And I don't know what do downstream processes I might be getting ads for medical products because I have, you know, extra pictures of artwork that th thinks of syringes. I, I don't know, but it's interesting thinking about how these categorizations uh, influence these systems. 
So that, with that, I'm going to close off just by showing some visualization. So one final way that you can understand my artwork is just by explicitly trying to look in the imagination of the computer. So this is an artwork I did called Two Scorpions. Uh, and by using a, a computer vision system or visualization technique, which I didn't develop, I'm borrowing it called neural caricatures, you can ask the system what it sees when it looks at this, what the neural network imagines. And so this is an example of uh, that print. So I can go back to the print and then I can ask, sort of go into the imagination of the network. And you'll see it pops into this more three-dimensional form, which I think gives you some context for how the network is interpreting this print. And then the final one I'll do is this two chickens, which I showed you one version of this before. So this is the actual print. And this is, you know, you don't have legs and beaks in the print, but when it imagines the, ver the, the detailed version, you do get that. Uh, and then uh, there's actually a more recent version I've done where you can actually also ask the system to uh, separate the foreground and background and give you some sense of the 3D. You know, so you can take this chicken, this virtual chicken, and you can start moving it back and forth, sort of in a pseudo 3D. And in that way, you can sort of see the print, how it's imagined and how it uh, manifests in the imagination as kind of this 3D object. So this is very, you know, ongoing work. This is just a rough sketch I'm showing, but I think sort of understanding these interpretations is sort of an interesting second level way of, of interpreting this. So that's, that's my whole talk. Just to wrap up, the core ideas that I hope I've, I've shown you here are machines have their own ways of seeing. Um, we, we looked at some of the ways that those are the same and different uh, as how we see things. Uh, because of this, the, they have this exotic different way of existing. We can create art that's for and by machines. And in doing this, we can appreciate the ways that machines perceive the world, how they might be similar, how they might be somewhat, sometimes a little uncanny, uh, what the, what, how lack of common sense can influence uh, its visual concepts. So that's it. Uh, that's me. There's my online handles to my Twitter and my Instagram. If you want to follow my work online, or if you want to see or buy any of my prints, you can follow the URL there down in the bottom right. Thank you. I believe I've now stopped talking and handed over to the presenters to take control. Bravo, bravo, Todd, that was phenomenal. <laughs> Loved it. Such a great talk. So we have, we have 87 people here and a bunch of questions coming in. So let's see. Sophia, are you going to handle them? Or Ray, Lara, do you want me to? We could take care of that. That would be great. There are so many good ones. You'll know which ones to choose. OK. All right, let's see. Um, this is from Caitlin. She says, you have fantastic images, such interesting work. You position, you position the Perception Engine series as a symbolic abstraction, but I'm wondering if and how you see these works relating to abstraction and modernism. These explorations of abstraction in its purest forms as an expression of a subjective inner state or of a medium rather than of an object. Abstraction is often put in opposition to figuration, but it seems like the two come together in your work. For the machine, these images are a figurative representation of a specific object, even though it looks very abstract to us. Please comment. I'm, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> rereading it and trying to come up with a, the question, if, uh, the question part of it. I, I don't disagree. Um, uh, I do think that, um, that there's a, a lot of um, themes that are relative to modernism and relative to, um, you know, uh, uh, impressionists, cubists, Futurists, where, where you're, you're trying to come up with different ways of, of, uh, of representing these familiar things in an abstract way. Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit to, um, um, to, to separate abstraction and figuration, so I don't think I'll, I'll tack that one. But I do think that um, maybe the, the, the core here of what I can go back to oops, is um, is this idea that, um, that these shapes, and this is what I was showing with the tick. So the, the, on the right, you have the, these ticks, these actual individual ticks. And what I think of this is, is through, there's a process by which you can use these computer vision systems 
to, um, to not only represent ticks, but where it becomes an abstraction to me is where it actually represents ticks better than any individual photo of a tick. So this is where uh, Scott McCloud, he, he calls this uh, simplification. And I think this idea that you can remove features and you can highlight maybe the, the salient bits uh, in a way that gives you a, a better approximation for what the, the visual concept is. So I think that's one of the things I'm hoping to accomplish in, in my work. And that's one of the reasons that I, I show these works in multiples. So here where I have the works presented in multiples, I think you can really see, um, you can really see what, what ties these together and what it is that a computer or a computer vision system makes, makes something have sort of chickenness or makes it something have some of these qualities. Um, uh, what features are important when it's discriminating one type of object from another. Good. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. I mean, I think, I think she's getting at this idea that, that in the modernism and abstraction, there's this always subjectivity and a, a very personal experience of interpretation. Whereas here, it's, it's very much in the, in the realm of this machine, which has its own model of, of abstraction, right? That's what you're, you're representing here. Um, here's another question about, um, where is it? It was, um, oh, where is it? Have you, have you looked at, um, um, have you, have you looked at, at other words like, um, here it is, Andrea Gagliano, um, very beautiful work. Many of your pieces are representations of physical objects. Have you experimented at all with less concrete concepts like togetherness or sustainability? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so uh, one of the, uh, the answers is yes, in as much as not safe for work is an abstract concept. Um, and that's one of the reasons I went in that direction is because it's not even kind of unified what it is. But keep in mind that all of these, um, all of these concepts bottom out in a, in a data set. So I could, and I think it would be interesting to try to make a data set that, um, that embodies togetherness. But one of the reasons I've been focused on concrete objects uh, is because what I like to do, and that's what this was kind of showing with the rabbit is, I, I like to verify, I like there to be a verification step. And so far there aren't, um, there aren't conventions in computer vision about how to represent togetherness or sustainability. So I could, I could make my own data set of what I thought sustainability would be. I could train a data set, I could train and make an image of sustainability. That would be a very private and perhaps um, uh, overly specific idea that I would not be able to share. So with me, one of the, the, the things I'm interested in is this shared grounding of concepts. So what is it we're teaching computers? Why are we teaching them that? Why are we teaching computers uh, what a domestic rabbit is? Why do we teach computers um, you know, what pornographic imagery is, well as to protect us. So I think that because uh, this idea of teaching togetherness or sustainability isn't um, sort of the bread and butter of these public systems, I haven't done that. Uh, but that said, I am interested in, in investigating that. So for example, I, I would be interested in looking at what a self-driving car thinks of its, what is, what is the, what does it look like to look through the eyes of a self-driving car? It probably has these strange concepts of collisions and other things that you wouldn't have for uh, a more general purpose system. Um, so I think part of this Good. depends on whether, whether you can have a shared grounding across systems for these concepts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because you can, you can type togetherness into like a Google search engine or a concept like love or fear and you get, you get a huge selection of images, right? So you could imagine training on those. That's true. That's absolutely true. You could choose kind of an unfiltered, uh, unfiltered data set and you could come up with an interesting result. And I think that would be a, a fun investigation. What you would have trouble doing is you would have trouble closing the loop. So when, in the end, you would have an artifact that would be, uh, be a representation of love or togetherness, but you would not know whether that is embodied by any other system other than the one you created, if that makes sense. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Kayleen Stocking asks, I've seen otherworldly pictures of um, a tennis ball or something that seem to focus much more on the textures. And you mentioned this, Tom. I thought it was a really interesting observation that um, many people believe that, you know, the way it recognizes cat or dog and, and fish is because of the texture somehow embedded. 
But your point is that you actually eliminate that texture in this example, yes. And I'm curious, can you say a little more about, here's the question is, um, what, what about your approach puts the focus more on the shapes than the, than the texture? Yeah, the, the, uh, the simple answer is, is that I remove textures. So um, I, I purposefully make, um, or, or I have a uniform texture. So I, I force the system to try to draw without being able to rely on textures. Now, if you, if you compare this work to the later work uh, where we're using generative adversarial networks, like this work here, you know, you're giving the computer the complete freedom to draw whatever it wants, to basically have free reign. And so it's of course gonna use textures and reflections and everything like that. But, um, but what I did is I used my background in drawing systems to kind of say, well, I can introduce constraints into this and I can try to make it, I can force the system to draw essentially abstract art. Um, and so, the, and, and it was an unknown, uh, it was unknown whether that would be successful at the time. Like, like, uh, like you said, it wasn't, it was, there was debate about whether that was even possible, but it doesn't work for all categories. There may be some categories that are reliant on textures, but there are a large number of categories within these systems where the global structure is enough to, um, to convince the system that it's looking at a coherent object. Uh, and that was one of the more rewarding parts of this is in, and that's what I think this graphic shows is that you can have the same kind of density, the same colors, uh, uh, just rearrange the elements and you get a, a, a drastically different result in the eyes of the, of the machines. Yeah, I would absolutely, this is a beautiful proof right there, as elegant as can be of exactly a counterexample to this point that I've always believed that it was largely texture, but uh, you're obviously made, it, made the point. Very, well, very I, th I think, I mean, I think it, there is texture being taken into account. So you can think of it as a voting system and maybe texture gets a big vote in the system, but if you just right. take all the texture out, there's something else there. There's still something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, very interesting. All right, so there's a few questions about your, th this other sort of meta question about where you view yourself. And here's one, how, how much of your hand is in the, in the, the computer's drawing style? In other words, how much do you teach it or randomize its style? This is from S. Simons. Okay, that's a great question. So I've, uh, I, I certainly have my own aesthetic. And uh, when, I, when I went back to this, uh, when I introduced this idea of inverting the, the tool, usually when, you, when people are using these drawings or when people are doing AI art, a lot of times the aesthetic is uh, dictated by the tool and then the, you are expressing your, your, your uh, it, you can think of it as form and content. So the form is often dictated by the tool, but the content is by, dictated by the artist using the tool. Here I've tried purposely to invert that. So yes, I've chosen a very specific aesthetic. The aesthetic is, for example, uh, curved lines and not straight lines. It's uh, layers of ink, halftone patterns. So I, I come up with a visual vocabulary and then I, I restrict the results to that vocabulary. And that's very much on purpose. So I don't think that this work, for example, perception engines would be as powerful if the, if the system had free reign over choosing different primitives and aesthetic styles. In fact, that's one of the reasons I did the specific series is because I wanted it to force it to use roughly the same number of primitives, roughly the same style, but to try to come up with unique results based only on the concept. Um, so I think, I think, uh, the question exactly gets it right, is that I'm imposing an aesthetic sensibility on the sort of visual form, and then I'm turning the system over to the neural networks to express kind of different content in the, in the context of that system. And I would have to commend you. I mean, I think this is a perfect example of how your, the hand of your, your, your hand is, it comes through because these all have a style. There's a consistent style to this body of work and it is, it's going across. So if you just let the machine infer its components, I don't think you'd see that. I mean, you have controlled that in a very interesting way so that we can look at this and we can look at a 11th image and say, oh, it fits. This is, this is a Tom White. In fact, I've done that on, I've seen that on various places on the internet. I'll see it pop up and I'll recognize immediately that it's you, even though they're all very different, but you, it's your style. And that's something you've imposed very consciously. It's not coming out of the AI system at all. Is that fair? Yeah, and I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, I think 
this ties into theories of creativity. Um, I think that a lot of creativity is born from constraints. So um, uh, I think that it is my job as the artist, or I'm, I'm happy to take on the role of, of imposing this style. And I think one of the things that makes the body of work interesting is forcing all the work through the lens of the style, uh, as you uh, alluded to. Great. Okay, there's a lot of questions about the adult content, but I think we might just skirt over them. Um, <laughs> very Do we have a separate adults only uh, yeah. version of the question and answers? Well, there's one person who said something really interesting that um, a lot of times in the, in the classifications that the computer did recognize the, the, the content of you know, chicken, et cetera, but it also said often art. So it, it, it recognized it as an artwork, I suppose, somehow. And it's saying, isn't that, isn't that a sense that the, that the system is interpreting it differently than just a, an image? Um, yes a and photo? no. Um, and yeah, and this, this goes into like, what, so, so what does it mean to interpret the image? So, so, so a lot of times uh, these systems will be hooked up to decision-making processes. And so like we saw in the instance of my image not getting, uh, I had an image that wasn't posted to my blog because it thought it was illicit content or thought it was you know, uh, not safe for work. So yes, maybe it did think it was art, but it still thought it was objectionable and filtered it. Um, I guess, I guess you, you raise a fair point. You can use these tools to kind of discriminate between a real object and a representation of an object. So here again, there's penguin and there's art. I think stencil is even one of these. And so that's, that's a fair characterization. Um, but I think in practice, a lot of times these systems uh, are, not, are not making that discrimination. I think if you think about, you know, when you go online and you go shopping on Amazon for one product, it shows you five other ads for the same kind of product. I think these are generally very permissive, in practice, very permissive algorithms that say, well, I saw you looking at a penguin why don't I show you, you know, five other penguins? So I think I think it all depends on how how smart the implementation is. It I think it is true that it's that you couldn't purposefully try to train an algorithm that did make that uh, that did discriminate between those cases. Well, it's interesting just to follow up on that. And that was Frankie, by the way, here that insight. Um, the images that you're training for are generally photographs, right? And one thing I'm just curious about: what if you say took the style of an artist? like Andy Warhol. And well, he's probably not a good example because a lot of his work derives from photographs, but let's say Picasso or something. And you took, you know, thousands of, of, of images from Picasso's sketchbooks and used that to train. Well, would you, do you think you would have something that would be recognizable in the abstraction of a Picasso? Is that? Yeah, yeah no, that's, it's a valid question. It's a really interesting idea. Um, but one of the, but it's a little bit, so you, you hit the nail on the head about me focusing on photos. And there's two reasons that I do that. One is because in practice, that's how these systems are generally made as they're made using real world examples, but also kind of going back to this idea of robo exoticism, or as I think of it as the computers being their own culture. I, I'm kind of fascinated with this idea that, that, that you can generate sort of this um, bubbled culture that's trained only on real world images without being ex exposed to culture and not being exposed to kind of mass media and see what kinds of iconography it comes up with. So usually I stray away from that because I see that as kind of polluting or mixing in real world images with kind of our own interpretations of images. Um, so I, I, I kind of consciously have avoided that because I'm interested in like, well, what does, what does you know, an abstraction of a rabbit look like to a system that's only seen real rabbits, that hasn't seen Bugs Bunny or whatever these other interpretations right. of things are? That said, I think if you intentionally went down that route and said, well, what if you take uh, only these sort of secondary cultural artifacts and try to classify those, can you get back to the original? I think that would be an interesting investigation. Thank you. Tom, it's so interesting, this work, and your presentation was so well-crafted. I, I just like your work. It's just so elegantly put together. I want to close with, the, with one last question. Um, this comes from Atsu Katani, and he asks, um, coming back to, to Stuart Davis, where you, you, you cited him with the, with the fan and, um, you know, the, the, that he sat down for a year with the same objects to really try and understand them and see through to find something new. Um, 
egg beater ray. Um, what what do you think? Is there is there a possibility ha that that in some way through this process that you're you're pursuing that that you or others that that will be able to see something new analogously? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I I would hope you've seen some new things already. So when I showed you. Yeah. Oh no! I didn't, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, no, that that sounded wrong. That came out wrong. I didn't mean to imply. Yeah, all of your work is is really interesting and new, and the whole talk was filled with with uh, fresh insights. But what I'm saying is, um, I guess I'm trying to push back, come back to the um, Stuart Davis analogy, which was what was his goal in contrast to yours? Is it analogous? I, I think so. So I pulled up a separate slide, which is my Dalmatian dog. I, I'm going to say that if you trapped me in a room for a year with a Dalmatian and I was a good painter. Maybe eventually by looking at it, the Dalmatian, I would come up with something abstract like this. Um, yeah. okay. um, so I, that, that's the kind of the parallel that I'm kind of draw is like, here is, a, yeah. here is a representation of kind of the visual formal qualities of a dog separate in a very abstract sense from what it means to be a dog. And I think that's where mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to draw that parallel is that we can use computer vision systems to, as a form of enlightenment to say, well, what is it? You know, we're so it's hard to see something in a new way. We're so, you know, we know what a dog is. We have a certain opinions for dogs, but what, is, what happens if you show just pictures of dogs to a system and then you ask it for an abstraction? And so, um, yeah, so I think that, that that's, I do think there's an analogous way, but I, I think there's, there's plenty of headroom to take this a lot in all kinds of different directions, because I think that, uh, I really think I've only scratched the surface here. And like you said, I'm very much attached to a specific style and aesthetic, uh, which doesn't necessarily have to, you know, this is my approach to it, but I think there's many, um, there's a really high ceiling on, on different approaches to, to investigating this. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I have to say, I think one thing that we're always striving for, all of us in, in, in this world, and especially in the art, art world, is to try to, to see something that we've never seen before, that to try and pierce through you know, our, our preconceptions. And, you know, I think we had a huge example of this in the past seven weeks as we've, we're facing this, this thing that almost very few of us expected to see. And now we're seeing it for the first time. And I, I just want to thank you for making the effort to come at this time with all of these constraints. And, um, and as an artist, you, you really lived up to them beautifully. Thank you so much for being here. And on behalf of everyone, I wish we could give you a huge round of thunderous round of applause over this Zoom, but that's one thing Zoom doesn't offer. So it'll have to be just one of us, but, uh, but for all of us, uh, Tom, thank you so much. Well, thanks, Ken.